Our next unit is going to cover electrons and their configurations. We're going to first start with something called the Bohr model of the atom. Before we start talking about electrons, though, we need to talk about matter, energy, and the relationship between the two of them. So this is going to kind of gloss over some high-level chemistry and physics uh, to get to the point here. We're just going to kind of get to right to what it's at. At the atomic level, matter has properties similar to that of energy, and energy has properties similar to that of matter. Uh, energy moves in waves, okay, so, you know, oscillating wave. The closer we get to atoms, the more we zoom in and look at them, uh, the more we see that they have behavior like waves, okay? So they have sort of some of these uh, properties of energy. Matter also has mass, energy does not. So you might assume that energy does not have mass on a smaller scale, it appears to. So there's kind of a, a crossover between matter, right? We understand to take up space and have, have a mass, uh, and energy, which doesn't really have a mass and it's moving in a wave-like pattern. So there's some crossover here. We call this wave-particle duality, right? And so we're skipping over a lot of, sort of high-level chemistry and physics to get to this point. Uh, but understand that there's right kind of a... a uh, Dual, dual nature, a duality to energy and matter. So in the 1900s, scientists start beginning to theorize relationship between particles and energy, right? As we start understanding uh, what protons, neutrons, and electrons are, uh, scientists start questioning sort of what is the relationship between them. Uh, and this might be an equation you've seen before, right? Maybe the most famous prediction when it comes to matter and energy and their relationship uh, it comes from this guy that you've probably all heard of before, Albert Einstein. His equation, E equals mc squared, okay? And this is the equation that's going to show how matter and energy are related. Uh, the E is energy, m is the mass in kilograms, and c is the speed of light squared, okay? And this energy comes out in joules. So the energy stored in matter, if you want to think of it like if you could convert all of the energy in matter, okay, all the into just pure energy, this would be the equation for it, right? This is where we get, you know, how you can get atomic bombs making tons and tons of energy from just small amounts of mass, right? C is a pretty big number, and then to square that gives you a really big number. Uh, but the energy stored, stored in matter is equal to the mass of that object in kilograms multiplied by the speed of light squared. And you get this unit, a kilogram meter squared over second squared, which is what a joule is, okay, one joule. Uh, but that's where this equation comes from. Like, what is it? What is E equals mc squared? Well, it's an equation that relates matter and energy. So kind of getting back into energy and it moving in waves, energy also exists in small packets called photons. Uh, so they're not just one continuous stream of things. They're in small packets called photons. We call that quantized. Energy is quantized. It's not a constant stream of energy, but rather large separated packets of energy. This is going to be important here in a few minutes when we're talking about electrons, right? So, you know, you've got atoms and, and matter, which are, you know, physical things taking up space and having a mass, and you've got energy, which is moving in waves, right, photons that are quantized. Okay, so getting into the guy who's the star of this section, Niels Bohr, um, right, the Bohr model of the atom. He worked alongside Ernest Rutherford, who you might remember from the gold foil experiment, uh, discovering the nucleus, right? Uh, this guy was from New Zealand. So gold foil experiment, discovering the nucleus and protons. Uh, Niels Bohr is going to propose a model of the hydrogen atom, which now today we call the Bohr model of the atom, right? Where we have a nucleus with protons and electrons. Well, in this case, just a proton since it's hydrogen. Uh, and an electron moving around that nucleus in some state. Uh, and then we also have, right, the nucleus here with the electron at a higher state, okay, an excited state. We'll talk about what these are here in just a moment. But that this electron moves around the nucleus at certain energy levels. So here are three parts to his theory. Part number one, the hydrogen atom has only certain allowable energy levels, and he calls each level a stationary state. So where this electron can exist is at different stationary states, okay, distant from the nucleus. The further out you go, the more energy involved to get to that state, but each one is called a stationary state, and it stays in that particular position. So this would be the ground state, as close as it can get to the nucleus, and this is an excited state where we've given it some energy, and now it's moved out. Okay, so the electron is going to stay in that particular stationary state 
uh, until it gains or loses some kind of energy. And while it's in that state and staying in that state, it does not radiate energy, meaning it does not give off energy. Okay, so while it's staying in that state, it stays in there. Okay, when it moves back down from an excited state back to the ground state, uh, it will radiate energy, which we'll see what that looks like here shortly. Uh, but when it's in the state, it does not let off energy. So how does the electron move between stationary states? This is part three of his theory. The atom changes to another stationary state only by absorbing or emitting a photon whose energy level equals the difference in energy between the two states. So what does that mean? That means to go from this ground state out to the secondary state. Okay, if I change the colors here. Okay, to go from the ground state to the stationary state, some photon of energy has got to strike this electron, okay? And it's got to have enough energy in that photon to push the electron to the next stationary state, to an excited state. If it does not have enough energy, it does not make the jump. It would just simply absorb it, okay? But it would not be enough to jump up, okay? So if it does absorb enough energy, then it jumps up to the next state. Well, what happens if it's up in an excited state? It can then release energy from it and go back down to the ground state, at which point, right, this is now let off energy. This is letting off radiation, okay, which is what we were talking about on the previous slide. So in order for an electron to move up, it's got to absorb enough energy to make that jump. If it doesn't get enough energy, it will not make that jump. And then for it to come back down, it will release a photon, okay, with that same just same amount of energy necessary to go back down. So to go up or down requires the same amount of energy. To go up, you absorb it. To go back down, you release it. Bohr labeled these energy levels with a number which he calls n, okay, uh, which is now called a quantum number, but he labels it n. So n equals 1 is the innermost orbit. n equals 2 is the next one outward. n equals 3 is further out than that. And that would go all the way out to n equals 7, at least for like what actually exists. You could theoretically go beyond that point, uh, but this is the right for this one that actually exists. Here's just a nice chart kind of summarizing what each of these energy levels look like from n equals 1 down to n equals 7. You can see how far away they are from the nucleus, right? Orbit radius in nanometers. That's 10 to the negative ninth meters. Corresponding energy levels, and we'll talk about in, uh, relative energies later on here, but you can see the Energy levels as you go out go up by a squared factor. What's really neat about this uh, absorption and emission of photons is that if they fall within a certain range, they are visible, right? So if, the, if that actual like wavelength is within the visible wavelengths of light, we will see it. Um, and so hydrogen has what we call line spectrum where we can actually see uh, these right, photons coming off of a hydrogen atom. A hydrogen atom is in the ground state when the energy level is equal to 1, when n equals 1. Uh, the atom's not radiating energy. It's just going around, okay, that nucleus, all right? Think of it as going in a circle. That's not really what's going on, but think of it as going in a circle and not changing from n equals 1. When energy is added from an outside source, the electron moves to a higher energy orbit. So, for instance, n equals 2. If it gets enough energy, it could go to n equals 3 or 4 or 5 or whatever number, uh, but it would just require more and more energy to make that jump. So once you're at the n equals 2 level, the electron is what's called an excited state. It can return to n equals 1 by emitting a photon of energy the same amount that it took to go up to n equals 2. And as I was saying, when that electron drops energy levels, okay, it releases energy. So it can drop to you know, the n equals 1 level or the n equals 2 level or the n equals 3 level or any of these other levels. What this chart is doing right here is it's actually summarizing really coolly uh, how all of this works. So let's say you have any sort of drop from a higher energy level back to n equals 1, n equals 2 to n equals 1, n equals 3 to n equals 1. Anything that's going to make that, drop, that jump emits a photon of light that is in the ultraviolet series. Now, we can't see ultraviolet light, right? That's UV light. We can't see that, but that would be what's being let off. And if you have a detector to check for UV radiation you would see that radiation coming off of a hydrogen atom if it makes a jump back down to the n equals 1 level. If you make a jump down to the n equals 2 level, so n equals 3 to n equals 2, or 4 to 2, or 5 to 2, or 6 to 2, uh, you're going to see numbers with wavelengths within the visible series. Okay, it's called the Balmer series. Uh, so an n equals 3 to n equals 2 drop will give you kind of a red color. 
Uh, a a four to two drop kind of gives you that cyan blue. Five to two is a darker blue. Six to two is kind of a violet color. All right. And then over here, the infrared series, anything that drops to the N equals three level from beyond that gets you infrared light. Okay. Which again, we can't see, but if you had a detector for IR radiation, you could sense it. So this is kind of showing you how all this works, right? If anything that drops to N equals one produces ultraviolet light, uh, almost anything that drops to N equals two is going to give you visible light. And anything that drops to N equals three is going to give you IR light radiation. You might think of this as kind of like climbing a ladder. In order to make a jump from you know one rung to the next rung, right? If this is the n equals one level and this is the n equals two level, it's kind of an all or nothing thing. You have to have enough energy to make it to the next level or you don't get to go up a step, okay? So when they say think of it as like climbing a ladder, that's what they mean, that you either make it to the next rung or you don't and you stay here. So when you know, you've got an atom here, electron, and it's going to get hit with some sort of photon of energy, okay? If this photon does not have enough energy to make it go from the n equals 1 to the n equals 2 level, uh, then it will just stay at n equals 1, okay? So that's kind of how we want to think of this. If it does have enough energy, all right, it would make the jump to n equals 2 or n equals 3, depending on how much energy is in that photon. So that kind of summarizes what the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom is, right? You've got a single proton with a single electron, and the electron can jump between energy levels, right, which we number as n equals whatever number distance from the nucleus. There are limitations to Bohr's model, uh, and th these are the two. Number one, this only accounts for hydrogen atoms. Uh, we can only get the spectral lines for hydrogen. We know they exist for other atoms, right? For instance, neon signs, right? You've seen neon signs before. Uh, neon signs, right? They're doing a similar thing. They're giving f electrons within neon atoms energies to jump up and then come back down. And when it comes back down, it lets off that, you know, characteristic red-orange glow of a neon light, okay? We know it exists. However, we don't have anything that actually uh, correctly models that. So, if, you know, there's still stuff to be discovered in the world of chemistry. So if you can go figure that out, you'll probably win yourself a nice prize, okay? But so his atom, his model only works for a hydrogen atom. Uh, and so the second thing is with more research, right, it's likely that electrons do not move in circles around a nucleus, okay? So we really wouldn't say that electrons move in perfect circles around the nucleus. That's not really what's going on. However, for us to understand what's happening with these atoms, it's good enough for right now.